Hello family, it's uh, day two, episode two of our Acts series. Hope you guys are enjoying it so far, though we're only just one episode in, but we still hope that you are enjoying it. And our encouragement is that you also go on this journey with us together, that you pick up your own Bible, make time, go through the book of Acts as we will be going through it, the book of Acts uh, throughout the month of, uh, of August. So please join us, participate, let us engage and let us learn and grow <clears throat> and grow together. Uh, my question, I want to start off today with a question. Uh, and my question is, what are your reasons for going to church? Why do you go to church? Are you going to church because of community, because maybe you are lonely and you are bored, or because you get to meet uh, potential clients uh, for business, you meet business partners, investors, for inspiration? What are your reasons for going to church? So please, engage with us in the comments below. So let us start. Uh, so we are on Acts 2, and we are landing on the day of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. So they were united in one place, as we saw from verse 1. Suddenly there was a sound from heaven, like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames of or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them, and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other tongues as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. So they were gathered in one place, in one accord, praying as they would constantly do. And as they were in that place, the Holy Spirit fell on them, and it settled on them, and they started speaking in other languages. Verse 5, at that time, there were devout Jews from every nation living in Jerusalem. When they heard the loud noise, everyone came running, and they were bewildered to hear their own languages being spoken by the believers. So after they heard this mighty sound, everybody came out. To come and see. We do that uh, as well. That if there's a big bang, you go outside, go check what is going on. Curiosity. So they were also curious. They wanted to find out what is that noise. And as they went out, they found the believers, that these believers were speaking in their own languages. And they were completely amazed by that, that I can hear, I can understand what these guys are saying. Uh, there's a story that John Bevere shares that during a meeting, uh, somebody was speaking in tongues, and after the meeting, the, a gentleman who was sitting behind asked the, the, the person who was speaking in tongues, how do you know that very ancient dialect of French? But the person didn't know that they were talking French. The Holy Spirit had just come on that person, and they just started ministering, only to find out that it was an ancient dialect of French. Verse 7. They were completely amazed. How can this be? They exclaimed. These people are from Galilee, and yet we hear them speaking in our own native languages. Here we are. It lists all of them, maids, people from Mesopotamia, Judea, Pontus, from the province of Asia, Egypt, Libya, and visitors from Rome, Arabs, Cretans. So these were people from with, who had different native languages. So some were Galanga, some were French, some were Italian, some were speaking Mandarin. But somehow this group of people were all speaking in a language that, that they could all understand. Not the language, rather, but rather they were all speaking in their own native languages. And 
we all hear these things speaking, all these people speaking in our own languages about the wonderful things God has done. They stood there amazed and perplexed. What can this mean? They asked each other. I like that what was being declared for that this they were declaring the wonderful things God has done in each and everybody's language so that everybody could understand. That is the power of the Holy Spirit. And we see the miraculous work of the Holy Spirit here that even though you are coming here, you don't speak the languages, I, the Holy Spirit, will make you speak in a language that these people will understand and they will hear the good news that nobody misses out on this good news. And they were declaring the wonderful things that God has done. That is our job as Christians, to declare the wonderful works that God has done. But others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying, they are just drunk, that's all. Isn't that how life is? It doesn't mean how... It doesn't matter how wonderful uh, something is, that there will be some people who will nitpick at it. Some people who will try to bring discouragement, who will try to downplay what is going on. They were now criticized that, hey, these people are drunk. But these guys are talking and the people can understand them. So how does somebody who is drunk speak in a language and people are able to understand? Drunk people... You can't understand a drunk person, but you can see that it's just people with hardened hearts. And I think I just want to encourage us here that we do not, let's not let us not get discouraged when we are doing what God has told us to do, that there will be naysayers, that there will be people who come to try to discourage us, that we leave our posts, that those people will always be there. They remind us of Pharaoh, that Pharaoh, after seeing all of these plagues, still his heart was hardened. So let us not let the crowd keep us quiet. Let us be like blind Bartimaeus. And the crowd was telling him, hey, keep quiet, you are making noise. He still screamed, son of David, have mercy on me. So let us not... Let the crowd, let us not let the crowd silence us and discourage us. Because the number one area that the enemy will attack will be the mind. And he will whisper to you and try to bring discouragement to you. Tell you that you are useless, that nobody cares about you, that nobody loves you. Well, the truth of the matter is that there's a God who, in heaven who loved you so much that he sent his only son for you. So verse 14, we find Peter here preaching to the crowd and he's explaining, these people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is so much <laughs> early for that. No, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel, who said these words. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people, so this spirit is not for a select few, but it is for all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit. Even on my servants, men and women alike, they will prophesy. And I will cause wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and clouds of smoke the sun will be dark and the moon will turn blood red before that great and glorious day of the Lord arrives. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Isn't that just wonderful news that this is not for a select few, that for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That it is not just for the Jews, but it is for everyone who calls on the name. Of the Lord, that it is an open invitation. All you have to do is to call on the name of the Lord and you will be saved. People of, of Israel, listen, God publicly endorsed 
Jesus the Nazarene by doing powerful miracles, wonders, signs through him, as you well know. But God knew what would happen and he prearranged and his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed with the help of lawless Gentiles. You nailed him to a cross and killed him, but God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life, for death could not keep him in its grip. King David said this about him. I see that the, I see that the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. No, one, no wonder my heart is glad. My tongue shouts his praises. My body rests in hope. For you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. You have shown me the way of life and you will fill me with, with the joy of your presence. That he conquered the grave. We can visit the graves of all the other gods that they are, of all humans, for all human beings that are there. We can visit their graves, but the tomb is empty. He is not there. That our King, our Lord and Savior, He is risen. He defeated the grave. Dear brothers, about this, you can be sure that the patriarch David wasn't referring to himself. For he died and was buried, and his tomb is still here among us. But he was a prophet, and he knew God had promised with an oath, oath that one of David's own descendants would sit on his throne. David was looking into the future and speaking of the Messiah's resurrection. He was saying that God would not leave him among the dead or allow his body to rot in the grave. God raised Jesus from the dead, and we are all witnesses of this. Now he is exalted to the place of highest honor in heaven at God's right hand. And the Father, as he had promised, gave him the Holy Spirit to pour out upon us, just as you see and hear today. For David himself ascended into heaven, yet he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit in the place of honor at my right hand until I humble your enemies, making them a footstool under your feet. So let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified to be both Lord and Messiah. Peter's words pierced their heart and they said to him and to the other apostles, brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This we see love and truth in action. That he did not withhold the truth from these guys. That he shared with them the truth. And as he told them the truth, the truth pierced their heart. The Bible tells us that in the last days there will be a generation that will only be attracted to preachings that only tickle their ears, that will only be uh, attracted to preachings that only motivate them and encourage them, that will shun the truth and will run away from the truth. People who preach the truth now will be labeled all manner of things, prophets of doom, whatever. But he told them the truth and the truth convicted them. So let us preach the truth, but the truth in love. And let us not withhold uh, the gospel or share certain parts of the gospel and omit other parts of the gospel because we feel that people might be offended if we tell them the truth or that the church will be empty. Are you going to please man or are you going to please God? This promise is to you, to your children and to those far away. So this promise, the Holy Spirit, is not just for you but it is also for your children and those who are far away. 
all who have been called by the Lord our God. Then Peter continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging all his listeners, save yourselves from this crooked generation. I remember when John came, John came and told the people that repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. When was the last time you heard a message that said repent for the kingdom of God is at hand? So these guys, you can see that they were warning people of what is to come if they do not turn away, if they do not repent, that they will perish in, a, in hell forever, for eternity. So let our hearts be for people and let us fight for people. But always love being the leading factor in all that we do, because otherwise we might end up just being resounding symbols. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day about 3,000 in all. So the people who were convicted by this truth that was preached by Peter with 3,000 people. Wow, amazing. 42, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals and to prayer. And a deep sense of awe came over them and the apostles performed many miracles, signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. Wow. They sold their property possessions and shared the money with those in need. So there was a, a certain level of unity that we see in the early church, that they shared everything amongst themselves, that others were selling properties and possessions so that they could take care of the brothers and sisters. And one of the key factors here is that after they repented, and gave their lives to the Lord, that they devoted themselves to teaching and to learning and to fellowshipping and to fellowshipping with other, other believers and breaking bread together. That is the blueprint of the church. And let us reflect today as we are the church, if we still resemble the early church, are we breaking bread together? Are we devoted to teachings and to learning? Are we devoted to prayer? Are we taking care of our brothers and sisters who are in need? And as we go through this series, let us be reminded, I think it's in James 1, that let us not be just hearers of the word, but let us also be doers of the word. Now let us take this word and put it into practice and run with it, with it rather. So guys, yeah, that is uh, verse two. We deeply encouraged by the early church and they are the example that they have set for us. So, let us follow suit and strive to be like the early church. Hope to see you guys uh, on the next one. Remember to like, share, subscribe, invite your family and your friends to also join us as we continue on this Acts series. Hope you are blessed and uh, have an amazing day today.